Jerusalem. Other than this fleeting reference, however, there is no hint of the miraculous history-shaping ministry to come. As far as the Bible's silent years are concerned, it is assumed that Jesus lived the modest life of a carpenter's son in the village of Nazareth, in the hill country of Galilee far from the religious sophistication of Jerusalem. His recorded miracle of turning water into wine occurred at a wedding feast in Cana, a neighboring community to Nazareth, the first hint of world-changing events to come. It's an amazing thing to realize that Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life here in Nazareth in the hills of Galilee. Simple upbringing, carpenter for a father, a young girl that was chosen of God, ordinary parents for an extraordinary man who would change the world. Born in Bethlehem but raised in a seemingly insignificant place, Nazareth in the hill country of Galilee, most of the people in the Jerusalem area of that day would not even know where Nazareth was on the map. God does things differently. He certainly did it differently here. He began by sending an angel to speak to a young girl to tell her that she was special in his eyes, that she was favored, chosen of God. God delights in doing things like that, showing up in the unexpected places, using insignificant places and people to perform his will and transform the world. He's done it throughout history. He did it here in a place called Nazareth. The landscape of the Sea of Galilee has changed little since Jesus walked along its shores. Through history, fishermen have cast their nets and caught fish in the sea, and weary travelers have found refreshment in its cool waters. The dividing of history began here along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Over my shoulder, Mount Arbel, and just below it, Magdala, the place where Mary Magdalena came from, a woman whose life Jesus wonderfully transformed. It was as Jesus walked along these shores, he came across fishermen mending their nets. Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother. He said to them, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. All they knew was how to fish, and even then they weren't great fishermen, but thus began an adventure for them that changed them and changed the world. And Jesus walked a little farther along the beach, and there he saw James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and they too followed him. And these, this small band of twelve, gave birth to a movement that has changed the world. It all began here by the shores of the Sea of Galilee in northern Israel. Perhaps on a day very much like this one, fishermen by the seashore, and this carpenter from Nazareth from the hills above. The history is his story, the story of Jesus, the Jew. Today, as in biblical times, the city of Tiberias is a thriving community of Galilee's western shore. But its prosperity continues in sharp contrast to other villages and towns which, although they also thrived in Jesus' time, are today mere ruins. Once they were centers of community activity, now they exist as places of idle curiosity for those seeking to unlock secrets from among their ancient stones. And yet, if the ancient stones could speak, what stories they could tell. Of blind men and lepers healed, of paralyzed limbs suddenly strengthened, of multitudes inspired by words spoken by the carpenter's son from Nazareth. But if his words could inspire, he could just as easily pronounce God's judgment as evidenced by the curses he pronounced upon those Galilean communities whose citizens had witnessed God's miraculous power but who had stubbornly refused to change their ungodly ways. Then Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you Chorazin! 
Woe to you, Bethsaida! If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Jesus' harshest words were reserved for Capernaum, which, more than any other community in the Galilee, had witnessed the miracle-working power of God. Jesus had lived there for a time. It had been his Galilean headquarters, located on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee and just west of the Jordan, which marked the dividing line between two political jurisdictions. Jesus may have been attracted to Capernaum because of its remoteness from ruling political powers. This would have allowed him a measure of freedom from political interference as he carried out his ministry. It's also possible that since Capernaum was home to Simon called Peter and was not far from the nearby villages of Bethsaida and Chorazin, where other followers lived, Jesus may have chosen Capernaum simply because he could be among friends. Whatever the reason, his earlier acts of compassion towards these communities did not stop him from declaring God's judgment and curses over them when he was moved to do so. Today, nearly 2,000 years later, they lie in ruins. The Jews call this place Kafar Nahum, transliterated Capernaum, the name familiar to many Christians. Jesus lived here for a time in fact, he made it his headquarters in the Galilee. Many miracles occurred in this community. People were set free from demon possession. Jesus raised Simon Peter's mother-in-law who lay ill with a fever. It was here that he paid the temple tax, but he did it uniquely because he sent Peter to fish, and in a fish's mouth, a coin, and with that, he paid the temple tax. I see that as a humorous side of Jesus. He could have provided the coin any, any way at all, but a coin in the mouth of a fish? How do we explain this Jesus? I think he paid that tax with a twinkle in his eye. He knew the power that he had to heal the sick and set the demon possessed free. And he did it all, all here inside Capernaum. But he was disappointed with the response of this community. He'd done so many miracles here, he had taught so much here, but the general population didn't seem to respond to those miracles and to his teaching. So ultimately, he pronounced a curse over Capernaum, as he did with Chorazin and Bethsaida, other communities around the Sea of Galilee. Amazingly, today, you can walk in the ruins of these places. They're no longer the vibrant communities they once were. God came, God left. And those people, many of them, missed the moment. The Israel of Jesus' life and times bore the scars of history and of numerous pagan influences. As each occupying empire was displaced by time and circumstance, it left behind its own particular memorials in the form of bridges, buildings, monuments, and temples. While Jerusalem had its share of pagan symbols, they could also be found in more remote places throughout the land. It was to one of these places that Jesus seems to have deliberately led his disciples, a place called Caesarea Philippi, which was located in an area well known for its pagan temples and idolatry. Greek as well as Roman temples were in abundance at Caesarea Philippi. In biblical times, the region was known as the land of Bashan, Today, it is called the Golan Heights, an agricultural area which also forms a military buffer zone between Israel and her border with Syria, which is located to the east and northeast. It was here in the region of Caesarea Philippi, in the ancient past, a place of pagan temples and idolatry, both Greek and Roman, that Jesus, the Jew who divided history, asked why opinion was divided over him. He said of his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They answered, Some say, 
John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he personalized it and he said to them, but who do you say that I am? It was Simon called Peter who answered and said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said to Peter, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for you could not have known this naturally. My father in heaven has revealed it to you. And I say unto you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. Peter's profession was made here in a place of idolatry. Jesus chose to ask his questions here where people came to worship pagan deities among the temples of Caesarea Philippi. He wanted to establish once and for all who he was for his disciples and for all mankind. Jesus' profound questions and Peter's inspired response formed a turning point. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus loved the city of Jerusalem, but he also wept over it. He wept because Jerusalem didn't understand the moment in time that God gave her when Messiah had come. He prophesied of the destruction of the temple. He said the enemies of Israel would come and lay siege to the city. It would be days of sorrow, and deep grief. He said the temple would be torn down. His disciples, intrigued by what he was saying, came to him on the Mount of Olives behind me. They came privately. They wanted to discuss things only with Jesus. What, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world, they asked him. He said there'll be wars and rumors of wars. There'll be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in many different places. But these will just be the beginning of sorrows, of birth pangs. False prophets will arise. There will be such times of death and destruction in the world that would God not intervene, no flesh could possibly survive. He said, no one knows that day or hour, but my Father only. Are we living in the days of the coming of Jesus Christ, of the Messiah? No one knows the day or the hour. And yet he gave us signs. He might just as easily have said, don't worry about it, it'll happen when it happens. But he didn't say that. He said, there will be signs. So that those who are knowledgeable, discerning, informed, will know by the signs, even that it is even at the door. It's soon and very, very soon. As we look at the world in which we live today, famines, pestilence, earthquakes. Yes, there have always been famines and pestilences and earthquakes, but these things seem to be gaining momentum, intensity, like a woman in childbirth. A pain, then another pain, then more frequent pains, and with each pain, a greater intensity of pain, as if it's mounting until there's then the birth. And you know what's interesting when the birth occurs? The mother forgets all of the pain. Beyond these momentous times, the hope that the Messiah will come and the world will finally find peace. It is ironic that while the name of Jerusalem